So let's use the same notation as before, so that V, A, B, but this time we'll just work on vector fields in R1. And these are time-dependent vector fields in R1. And the reason for this is that first we'll prove the theorem for vector fields in R1 and the existence of and uniqueness of solutions to ordinary differential equations there. And then we'll move on to differential equations in higher dimensions, but still ordinary differential equations. So let's suppose that V is fiber-wise globally Lipschitz. Then the ODE x dot t equals v t x t has a unique solution. And in fact, it's C1. So this is the theorem of existence and uniqueness of differential equations, solutions to differential equations. And for the proof, what we're going to do is define this operator phi v as before that takes arbitrary continuous functions on the domain a to b back to itself. So it takes a function x and it maps it to the function whose value at t is given by xa plus the integral from a to t v s x s and integrate that function. So this is the function phi v at x. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a couple of observations about this function We've already looked at what happens to it when we iterate it twice in a particular example, but what we'll now do is we'll use that observation and the fact that this is fiber-wise globally Lipschitz to actually find an appropriate bound on the distance between the application of this function to two different functions. So then for any two different functions, x and y, and this is where it's a little confusing because remember these are now functions on a b and we think of them as the position as a function of time and y is also the position as a function of time in r1 in this case what's the distance between these two functions after i apply this this function so if I take the distance between these two functions, and let's actually look at the point-wise distance. So for a fixed t, so let me put in a t parameter here and here. And let's take the absolute value of this. So what we notice, what's the definition? Well, we plug in this definition, and the xa term cancels, and we're left with a difference of terms here. So this is actually the, mag the um, absolute value of the integral of a difference of two functions. The first one is for x, so this is going to be s x s, minus the second one for y, v s y s, and then integrate that over ds, and then take the norm. Now, the norm of an integral satisfies the condition that it is less than or equal to the integral of the norm of its interior, of what's inside. So this is less than or equal to A, and then the norm of this function on the inside and then take the integral of that. So this is one of the properties of the ordinary Riemann integral. Now, when we look at this term, we can actually use our Lipschitz condition here. And notice that we have the same thing for a fixed point S. So using that condition, and let's call that Lipschitz constant just as before, L, the integral, 
from A to T. And what we have here is the distance between these two points, xs minus ys ds. Now, because our domain is compact, this distance is less than or equal to the supremum of all such distances over the entire domain on which they're defined. But again, by compactness, that supremum is always achieved and it's always finite. Therefore, this can be replaced by L integral TA, the max over all S, but the supremum over all S is exactly the distance between X and Y with respect to the supremum norm. And if you notice now, this expression doesn't depend on s. Therefore, we have l times this distance times the integral of the function 1 from a to t. And that integral is simple. It's just t minus a. So this is equal to l times the distance with respect to the sup norm between the two functions x and y times t minus a. Great, we got somewhere. It would be nice if L and T minus A, when we multiply them, is, let's say, less than 1. But in general, that doesn't quite work, right? For instance, the interval A to B could have been large, and T might be large. And then L could also be arbitrarily large. What if it's 10,000? Then this clearly is not going to give us a contraction. But let's try to apply this again, and then take the difference between these two values and just see what we get. We already saw that we can get far by solving some linear non-autonomous differential equations for some reason, and we should also be able to try to use that same procedure to see if it works. But this time we want to see if we can get a contraction. So let's take the square between x and y. And I'm going to save some time with this calculation. I already know that this expression is less than or equal to L times the distance between the two inputs. So let me use that step before jumping directly to here. So this is less than or equal to L times the integral from A to T of the distance between phi v x at this time s notice that the variable now is s minus phi v y s and then this is ds so all I've done was I've replaced x here with phi v x and y here with phi v y those are also two different functions and that's what I input here but now this expression, ignoring the integral, is exactly, where is it? Right here. And then we follow that through and we show that this was less than or equal to this. So let's use that again. So this is less than or equal to L times, well this is L times, so that's L squared times, let's keep this integral, we've got to make sure that we keep the integrals there. And I wanted to replace this expression then this is going to be an integral from, because this depends on s now, and the variable here was t, right, if you follow this through, I have to replace this t here with an s. So I have to have the integral from a to s of what function? The distance, which we know is a constant, but let me write it out anyway. And then I integrate with respect to some other variable. Let's call that r and then I put this ds back. So I want to make sure that I keep track of these variables and don't accidentally repeat one when I shouldn't. So this is a constant that gets pulled out. This is L squared, d sup, xy. Now what's this integral? The first integral is just going to give me s minus a. But then I integrate that from 0 to t, but now it depends on s, and what you actually get if you work out the calculus, you get t minus a squared, 
divided by 2. Ah, that looks worse. What if, again, t was really, really large and I squared it, then this would be even bigger than it was before, and l squared as well. And this 2, that doesn't look like it's doing anything at all. So it looks like uh, we're running out of hope. But let's try again. Because what do we have to lose? So if we do this one more time, let's take the third power, v x t minus the third power, v y t. Now that we have this at hand, we can take this, apply this procedure to it, and we'll get less than or equals to L with phi squared in here. It doesn't matter which way we do this, it, it really doesn't, but um, let me do that method. So it's L integral T A phi squared V, and now this time we have to keep track of our variables. This is X S minus phi squared V Y S D S. But this is less than or equal to this expression, right? That's what we just found. So if I plug that in, this is going to be less than or equal to L cubed now. That distance is going to get pulled out. So let's do that. And then we also have this one half factor, so let's keep track of that. And now I have T minus A squared. But this variable is S. That variable is t, so I have to make sure I put an s here. So this is the integral t a of s minus a squared ds. And what's the integral of that? I'll give you a second to figure that out before I write it. Well, that's just t minus a cubed over 3. Rewriting this, this looks like L cubed minus T, sorry, times T minus A cubed over 2 times 3, which is 3 factorial, times the distance between X and Y. And in fact, more generally, it's true that if I replace this 3 by N, and I keep doing this procedure, I will get something of the form some number raised to the nth power divided by n factorial. Now, raising something to an nth power eventually gets overpowered by, no pun intended, by 1 over n factorial. And the n factorial grows much faster. So eventually, for any epsilon that I pick, I can find a large enough n so that this expression here is less than epsilon for all n greater than that value that I chose. But I might have to go very far out in the sequence to do this. But I can always do it for sure because the limit of this expression as n goes to infinity with 3 replaced by n does tend to 0. And therefore, if I go way back, that means there exists an n so there exists some n here, some n here, such that this function now is a contraction because I can find a large enough n here so that this expression is strictly less than 1 and therefore satisfies the definition of phi n being a contraction. And because it's a contraction, and this is a complete metric space with respect to the soup norm, we know that there exists a unique fixed point. This proves that there does exist a continuous function on AB that satisfies this differential equation. What it doesn't prove is that that function is also differentiable. And I'll leave that part to you as an exercise, and this concludes the proof of the existence and uniqueness for solutions to ordinary differential equations.